Dennis, how did you get hold of the script to play Frank Booth in Blue Velvet? Were you looking for it? Did it come to you? Did you steal it? You know, I don't know how it came to me as an offer. Right. And I'm not sure how that, uh, you know, it just came through the agency and it came to me. And uh, uh, I read it and I, I was just, uh, I was amazed at what I read. And uh, the first time I really had any contact with David Lynch, I'd never met David Lynch. Uh, I already had the part and I, I, I called him on the telephone. Uh, he was in North Carolina. And they'd already started shooting, hadn't they? Oh, they'd already started shooting, yeah, in Wilmington. And, uh, and uh, I said to him, uh, they were having lunch, and I, I said, you know, you haven't made a mistake here. I am Frank Booth. And so he went back to the table, to Isabella and uh, Kyle, and he said, I just talked to Dennis Hopper. And he, said, uh, he said, he was Frank Booth. And I said, this may be very good for the picture, but I'm not sure uh, how we'll ever have lunch with him. <laughs> yeah. But he was, uh, he was terrific. David uh, was wonderful to work with. He, uh, he was uh, very, uh, it was sort of like a boy scout, very naive. And uh, 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 in those days, he wouldn't say, he said, now when you say, when you say that word, I said, well, that word's fuck, you know, <laughs> which he had also written the script. You know, he said, yeah, when you see that word. Or, uh, and he would say, golly gee, uh, that's solid gold. Uh, let's do one more. Sort of like Howdy Doody was directing, uh, or a Boy Scout leader, a uh, very straight one. So, um, but he, uh, he knew exactly what he wanted, and that's really, uh, I mean, to be working for an, an auteur film, filmmaker is always a thrill. Yeah. But, but you changed the character a little bit. You didn't want him to be a total psychotic, totally unredeeming. Well, I mean, I, I don't know whether I, changed, <laughs> whether I changed it that much. The only thing I really contributed, uh, I didn't really improvise. I mean, all the dialogue is uh, David's. Uh, uh, I did add the, the, the mask, uh, the thing of the mask, which uh, was in the script, uh, was written as uh, helium, uh, which makes you sound like Donald Duck. Uh, and. Uh, so what I thought for years was a great contribution was I said to David, I, I said, you know, I tried, he had the stuff actually there and I used it and it was making my voice sound strange. And I, I, I said, you know, when I read the script, I thought of this stuff as amyl nitrate or nitric oxide or something that would, you know, uh, set you off for a few minutes. And, uh, and he said he'd, I, he'd never heard of these things. And I said, well, watch this and I'll show you what it would look <laughs> like if you were on this. So I did it. And he said, oh, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. And I said, then you can dub the voice in later if you want to with the, this high voice. And he said, no, 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 let's, let's try this. And I thought, well, what a great contribution that was for many years. And then one time I was sitting thinking, you know, if I had just done it the way David had written it, where it really all it did was change the voice, and nothing else. What a different character that would have been, and even maybe even more sinister, uh, because his mind wasn't uh, disoriented by what he was doing. Mm. It just made him sound strange. I mean, that is a whole, a whole another very cold look at it. But, but he was obsessive. He really was in love with Dorothy, wasn't he? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh no, I mean, people have said, well, how could you play this terrible character that has no redeeming qualities? And I've said many times that. It, well, what are you talking about? This is a love story. This man is totally infatuated with this with this woman, and to the point that he kidnaps the husband and you know cuts his ear off and <laughs> whatever. But uh, no, it is. I mean, to me, it is uh, a love story and uh, uh, and a very bizarre one at that. Did, was David playing the music, uh, the Candy Cutting Clown, when you were singing the songs? Oh yeah. The, oh yeah. yeah. We had to uh, we had to learn it, mime it, uh, you know. Uh, do our, uh, what do you call it, uh, voice... Uh, voice over, yeah. yeah voice over, not voice over. Oh, looping. Uh, no, when you, when you mime, uh, not mime, but uh, you mouth something uh, that's being played. Yeah. Uh, Lip-syncing. Lip lip-syncing. Lip-syncing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we did do that. We memorized the song. Dean Stockwell was wonderful in that scene, too. Yeah. Mr. Swallow. But you, um, you, in one of the scenes, you're, you're physically moved. You start crying when she's, when, you know, when Dorothy's singing. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm playing with the blue velvet, yes. a piece of blue velvet. Yeah. Uh, 
choir. It's very moving. Yeah. 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 Did you expect the kind of response it got? Because people said you were Frank Booth and this was, you know, you were playing you to a certain mm -hmm. extent mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, my agency didn't really want me to do it. My manager didn't want me to do it. And, uh, and I said, look, you know, David Lynch is an important director. I said, I don't know how popular this film will be, but everybody in the industry will see it. And I know I can really do a good job in this part. So I, I want to play this part. And I want to work with David. So that was my take on it. Uh, uh, when I first saw the film, I, I took a lawyer to see it with me, and, and there was a little screening in New York, and he laughed from beginning to end. I mean, he never stopped laughing. He thought everything was the funniest thing he'd ever seen, and no one, everyone else in the theater was sort of looking at him and me, and it, they didn't know how to react. I wasn't sure how to react either. And, but he was just, he enjoyed it. He went out and said, this is the most wonderful film. What a funny film this is. And like, you know, I, that was his take. But uh, I, uh, I, I did three films right in a row. You know, I did, I, I, this is my first year of sobriety also. So I did all these films <laughs> sober. But I, first I did Blue Velvet. And then I went right from there to India. Uh, they did that in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Yeah. And then I went right into Hoosiers in Indianapolis. I didn't even come back to Los Angeles. I just uh, changed clothes, you know, and I was playing in Hoosiers. And then I came back to Los Angeles and went right into River's Edge, which these f three films, and I really like these three films. They may be some of the best stuff I've ever done. Totally different characters, but really literally, I only had a day off between pictures and I was into the next one. So it was a very productive year for me. Uh, and in a lot of ways, uh, I, uh, River's Edge was a really special kind of film to me. And, and when I look at it, uh, I like it as much uh, as I do Blue Velvet. Uh, uh, I, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, there are a lot of things about it that are more suited to my kind of thinking about film than David's. Uh, and I really I like it. So I, I had... Uh, I had uh, I really like that movie, so mm -hmm. I had sort of a conflict between the two films, just in my own my own kind of taste. Because David, uh, I mean, David is in charge. David tells you what to do, and you do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But so is uh, uh, Tim, uh, Hunter. Tim Hunter. I mean, Tim Hunter is a very, uh, very right on director. He's not letting anything get by him. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I really, I really, uh, that was a very moving piece to me. Uh, Hoosiers was a very strange, uh, strange thing for me because I, I, and I got nominated for an Academy Award for it. But first of all, I didn't want to do it. And David Anspa had, uh, and uh, 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 Pisa, the writer and, and director, came to me and, and uh, uh, it was going to be their first film. And uh, uh, they'd gone to the University of Indiana and they wanted me to play Shooter. And I said, I'm, I read it and I said, I'm not right for this part. Now I'm from Kansas, I basketball, I was growing up with basketball. Uh, this was made, this is the team that James Dean played against when he was playing in high school basketball in Indiana. I have a lot of associations so, with this and I said, this is, I'm not right for this part. There's not, and I'm not right for this part at all. An alcohol, like not right for the part. But, uh, you know, I said, you know, this is Harry Dean Stanton. This is certainly not me. And they kept on me and on me and on me and then got me into it. And through the whole movie, uh, Gene Hackman was saying, uh, gee, I don't know, you know, what are we doing sitting on this bench, this high school basketball? How did we get into this movie? Why did they shoot the stars <laughs> over here? What are these kids, you know? Anyway, it was, it was a wonderful movie. And a lot of people, like, you know, uh, that I see, uh, that's the film they really like. That's the family film that they've seen with their family, with their kids, and so on, which is unusual for me in my career. But back to Blue Velvet. Uh, Blue Velvet... It's like really has become in time, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a surrealist, it's the first really American surrealist mm -hmm. film to me. Uh, those, uh, the, the picket fences and the yeah, wonderful. And, and the insects underneath the ground and, uh, uh, and on the, uh, uh, with the picket fences and, mm -hmm. the, and the, the fire engines going by and slow-mo and the mm -hmm. roses and the bird and, the, you know, it's, it's wonderful kind of American uh, surrealism. And, uh, uh, I think David's a terrific talent. He was completely um, dissecting the American society and all the, what was there and what was really there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, mm -hmm. he just he opened a saw that people didn't want to see. Well, the original uh, the original response was quite violent against the film, wasn't it? They, oh yeah, yeah. They didn't yeah. really want to oh, yeah. know about this. Oh yeah. yeah, no, it was it was a tough one. Yeah. 
It is a tough film. It still is. And I think Isabella Rossellini was like so brave. I mean, here's a model that David has put on 35 pounds, you know, makes her gain 35 pounds and then takes and then her has her naked uh, mm. crawling around on the floor. I mean, that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of real guts and courage uh, from an actress to do that. And, uh, and also to believe in a director enough uh, to do that. To do that. Yeah. yeah. But it seemed everybody on the set was like that. I mean, Carl oh, yeah. McLaughlin, I mean, you know, he was playing a very fucked up kid, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But it all worked. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it works yeah. tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. And can that's you see that? Can you, yeah, I was going to say, can you see that when you see it in a script, when it came to you? Could you see that? Can you see how it's going to end up? Well, I don't know. You can never see how anything's going to end up. You yeah. can only see w whether you can do a good job. I mean, yeah. if you're being hired as an actor, whether you can do a good job as an actor yeah. uh, in that role. I mean, I, uh, people say, well, you take small roles in things. And I say, yeah, but, you know, I, I always, my criterion has always been, does my character have a beginning, a middle, and an end? I don't care how big it is. Do I have a beginning and a middle and an end to my character? Uh, and can I ha have a resolution? You know? yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about a couple of movies you, you directed. Um, out of the blue, mm. uh, you were originally hired as an actor mm -hmm. to work on in, a film in Canada. Right. And then halfway through, or two, two thirds of the way through, um, the director was fired and, and you chose to take over. Why, why did you take the role and why did you choose to take over? Mm. Well, first of all, Paul Lewis, uh, who was the producer uh, of Out of the Blue, uh, he was my... Uh, production manager on Easy Rider. He's the man that took me across country and made, the, made it possible, okay, Easy Rider possible. And he'd been with Jack Nicholson before that. He'd done the shooting and Ride the Whirlwind, uh, Ride the... Ride the Whirlwind, yeah. yeah Monty the Hellman movies, right. yeah. <clears throat> uh, he, had, he had been the production manager on those, and so he was sort of the king of uh, outlaw productions uh, as far as getting them made, getting them done on time, and so on. So he was the person that I went across country and scouted the locations with. Uh, uh, he was the guy that uh, let me make the movie and took us uh, uh, from motel to here at the crew, and, and just we did it in four and a half weeks going across country, so it was really, really amazing. Anyway, <clears throat> he's producing now Out of the Blue, so he hires me as a father, and I haven't, I haven't worked in quite a while mm. at this time. I'm, uh, so I go to Canada, and uh, I meet this young, uh, young director and his wife who have written the screenplay, and it's his first picture. So I go on the set, and I, 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 I suit up every day in my father outfit, and I go and sit in the trailer and hang out in the trailer, and for two and a half weeks I don't work at all. And uh, I've only walked on the set once and shook hands and left because I don't want to hang around and new director and look over his shoulder. Mm. So uh, Paul Lewis comes to me and he says, you've got to see dailies, it's awful, the guy that can't direct, so on and so forth. I said, Paul, maybe you don't know what he's doing, maybe he's got a different vision of things, you know, leave him alone, I'm not going to come to dailies until I work, you know, I'm not going to... And so like, you know, after two and a half weeks, uh, on a Friday night, Paul invites me to dinner and he says, I'm closing down the production, you're going to get paid. Linda's going to get paid, but, you know, I'm closing it down because uh, there's nothing usable. Two and a half weeks of shooting, there's nothing usable. So anyway, I said, wait a second. I said, let me see the dailies tomorrow. Let me see everything that's been shot. Let me look at it. And, uh, and I saw them, and there wasn't anything usable. And uh, I said, if I can rewrite this, and, like, you know, if I can rewrite this and start shooting Monday morning, uh, uh, I'll take over, and uh, and he says, okay, but you got to do it in four and a half weeks. And I said, okay, we can do that. So I took over and I rewrote the whole thing. And I I'd gotten to know Linda Manns, and I, I found that she plays. She drums. was cast. She was in the film. Yeah, she was playing. Yeah, she yeah. played drums. Yeah. So I said, put some drums in her room. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, there was also a punk movement going on in in Vancouver, and I went. I went to that, and I said, okay, let's see, that would be a reason that she would leave. She wants to be, it's not just Elvis that makes her run away because Elvis killed himself that she runs away, but she wants to go join a punk band or, I mean, give me some culture to go to, some underground kind of culture. So anyway, I added these things. Uh, also, the script was like from, uh, in the script, uh, she only uh, kills the father. Um, 
Uh, and also, uh, it's all from Raymond Burr's point he's of view lawyer. because he's yeah. the psychiatrist, psychiatrist yeah. and so it's how he saves her from this terrible, like you know, father Fate. and like you know, and, and this you know. Uh, so uh, I, and also, I had to shoot all of his stuff. I had to shoot all the scenes that he was in, knowing I was only going to use two little scenes. It was really amazing. So I, because he was the reason that we were getting the money from Canada, Raymond yeah, Burr, Canadian, Canadian, except that he had changed, <laughs> he had changed nationality, <laughs> citizenship, right? And like it, we lost it anyway. Yeah. But but anyway, it was funny. So anyway, he did that. Uh, yeah, Linda Manns was amazing uh, to work with. Uh, she was really uh, really childlike, and uh, uh, she she epitomized the punk rocker, the angry. Yeah. the angry child because she'd been abused by you as the father mm -hmm. and whilst you're in jail she becomes the father and tries mm -hmm. to hold yeah. the family together and yeah. and then when you come out um, she yeah. decides it's time for the end of the family right, right, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. that was a pretty bleak view of uh, American family life yeah it was also uh, it's sort of like to me uh, if uh, my character in uh, Easy Rider had lived and uh, had a family, uh, that would probably be yeah, how dysfunctional family. it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you added um, the Neil Young music. Yeah, that was it. like when I was editing, I heard uh, yeah. Out of the Blue and Into the Blue. No, actually, I think, no, it wasn't when I was editing. It was when I was, when I was trying to do it over this weekend, trying yeah. to get a script together. I heard uh, Out of the Blue and Into the Black, Hey, Hey, My, My. There's more to the picture than meets the eye. Rock and roll is rock and roll is never dead. The king is here but not forgotten. But this is a story about Johnny Rotten. Mm. So, Interestingly yeah. enough, um, Primal Scream have taken some lyrics out of Out of the Blue. You know, kill all hippies. Um, oh really? Yeah, it's in their new album. It's just come out. Wow. Yeah, so they took they've taken Linda's voice and they've put it on on the album of oh. Prim Primal Scream. Oh wow! You That's should listen funny. to it because it's a whole you know it's a whole different generation is now hearing you oh. know kill hippie scum you know. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. But again, the reaction to that film when it opened was really negative. It was just they everybody thought it was a nasty piece of work. Didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there were people. Uh, I remember a young girl in Boston crying, coming up to me, tears pouring out of her eyes, saying, tell me it was a dream, tell me it was a dream, tell me it was a dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So like, you know, but I, I don't know. And, and the critics, yeah, the, uh, there were some good critics, but most of them like said this was a nasty piece of work, basically. And, uh, and they wouldn't show it in Japan because of the suicide of taking the parents, a child taking the parents' uh, life is a, a no-no. Yeah. Probably in all society, I think. But, yeah. <laughs> well, they've rediscovered it. I mean, there's an audience that's rediscovered yeah. it now. It's become yeah. Yeah. quite a strong cult movie and yeah. a lot of people have found it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I understand that. Yeah. Uh, it's is uh, Sean Penn's favorite movie that I directed. Uh, no, it's a strong piece and like, you know, also, uh, I think it's difficult, I, I suppose because of the effect films have on an audience, it's difficult for people to look at things as symbols rather than actual, Actual, like, you know, what's really going on in the movie is more symbolic of a society and of a time and of a place and uh, rather than... Uh, hmm. Yeah, it was very specific, wasn't it? It was really yeah. about yeah. that yeah. time and place, the yeah. punk movement and yeah. Yeah. disillusioned youth. Yeah. But she was stunning. Oh, she was wonderful. Yeah. What a great performance. And yeah. we got into Khan. Yeah. We were in Khan uh, uh, in competition. And uh, she almost got Best Actress. She was, it was really close, mm. very close. Now, another film that you've had at a few film festivals is the last movie, mm -hmm. which after the success of Easy Rider, you were given a certain amount of carte blanche by mm -hmm. Universal to mm -hmm. go away and make this movie. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking when you started that? What did you want to do with it? Well, I had written the last movie with uh, Stuart Stern. <clears throat> Actually, it was my idea, and Stuart Stern wrote the screenplay. Uh, <clears throat> Stuart had written Rebel Without a Cause and The Ugly American. So, uh, and he was a friend. And I actually paid him, which I didn't have any money. But he said, it's like going to a shrink, man. If you want me to write this screenplay, you've got to pay me at least this much money. I said, oh, well, okay. So, uh, you know, I paid him. Uh, 
uh, a minimal sum, but it was a lot for me at the time, uh, to write this because I wanted to direct a movie. And I wrote this, I guess, probably four years before we did Easy Rider. Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter uh, read it and uh, went around, Peter Fonda and went around with me trying to raise financing to do this, uh, to do this film. We never could. So I immediately wanted to make the last movie uh, right after Easy Rider was successful. Um, and I got a, I got a deal at uh, Universal uh, Studios, uh, actually, uh, 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 Jewel Stein, who had been a, a, I dated one of his daughters when I was a, a young man, uh, Susan, uh, and uh, I befriended him. Uh, he went around after Easy Rider and said, look what my friend Dennis Hopper did, and he was showing everybody variety. Look at this, look at the, this money, and we have no youth program here. I want to start a youth program here. So he started the thing, got Ned Tan and, and uh, Danny Selznick, uh, David O. Selznick's son, to uh, start this uh, Young directors. Uh, yeah, and, and new youth program, directors yeah. program. Yeah, because so, they, they wanted to get back in touch with the audience. Yeah, so they pulled me in and they make movies for a million dollars. Right. You couldn't make them for more than a million. Right. But uh, really good deal to give you 50% of the film and uh, you know, come in and make it for a, mil a, a million or less. So uh, I went in and did the last movie. Uh, Peter Fonda did The Hired Hand. Uh, Bogdanovich did Targets. Uh, uh, somebody did Tulane Blacktop. Monty, Monty Hellman Monty did Tulane Blacktop. I think that may have been it. American Graffiti, was that in there? No. no, no. There was no successful film in this program. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this didn't work. Yeah. No, this was doomed, I think, from the beginning because of tax structure didn't quite work right. that way at <laughs> Universal Studios. However, yeah, uh, yeah it was... Uh, Anyway, I made the last movie. I went down and shot the last movie. But while I was making the last movie, a lot of things had changed in my mind since the time of writing it four years before. Uh, and uh, I, really, I really had some... I wanted to make a film about film. I mean, that was the original idea anyway. But then I went farther into it and thought, well, you know, as an abstract expressionist, uh, which was the first time America really had any art form of their own, they used paint as paint rather than trying to, to make it into something that wasn't that. So I thought that, uh, I mean, I use like leader at times. I use a, a thing that says torn, or I use a, a clapperboard. Mm. I, use, uh, I use these various things. And even, I even have cameras out of sticks, which is part of the, the, the narrative of, of the piece. But, uh, uh, and the uh, Indians taking over uh, the set when the movie company leaves. The Indians take over, they make cameras out of sticks and uh, they start acting out the violence that they saw the American movie company making in their Peruvian village. Uh, uh, so uh, that's basically what it's about. And a stunt man who stays behind and is living with uh, a young prostitute that he is uh, uh, living with, uh, actually I think is married, I, I'm not sure that I can remember that, but uh, living as husband and wife. Um, and he stays behind and he, he becomes Billy the Kid, the character, doesn't he? Well, he oh, stays yeah. behind and becomes uh, waiting for the movie companies to come back, and he becomes, yes, in the, in the movie, yeah. he becomes the character of Billy the Kid, uh, uh, so, caught somewhere between the priest and the director. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, and, uh, and I, I, there's this wonderful uh, so, I mean, destruction scene where I made the Leonardo da Vinci's horse out of it that was destroyed by the French archers. I made it out of bamboo and uh, this great horse of, uh, of da Vinci's. There's a lot of like really, I mean, to me a lot of like, uh, I saw it again the other night for the first time. The Cinematheque showed it here in, uh, in Los Angeles. I saw it in this big uh, theater, the big, uh, it's not the RKO, but whatever. The Egyptian. The Egyptian, yeah, yeah the Egyptian theater. Uh, Natalie Wood and Nick Adams, I used to go there all the time. But I saw it in this big theater, and uh, it looked really good. Uh, yeah, I, I, re I really enjoyed seeing it again. It's a tough movie. Um, it was a tough movie. It is an art movie. I mean, yeah. it's... It, I, won, I won the only prize given in 1971 at the Venice Film Festival, Sidalk, which is actually a literary award. The communists had shut down the festival that year, so uh, the Sidalk which is the oldest, uh, actually, cinema award I, I won, and an honorary award to John Ford the same year. But, 
Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I really love the movie. I really like it. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, and it's very difficult for people who worked on it. <laughs> people who worked on it just, they, don't, they, they know all the footage that I shot, and they yeah. know all the scenes that are not in the movie, and it's very difficult for them to, to look at it. Uh, uh, Stuart Stern uh, certainly doesn't recognize it as his screenplay. Uh, but, uh, but, I, what I, but what I did was uh, I wanted to involve an audience in, in, make, in, in a film, about a film and a, what's seeming to be a story and, and then bring everybody into what the, the story and then have the story just destruct in front of them and say, look, it's not really about that at all because it's just a movie. We're just making a movie and it's, you know, uh, I think there's a line in it. Yeah, you say it's for fun and all of them, they think it's for fun, huh? And you know what the priest says? The priest says it's a game. Mm -hmm. But you know what the problem is? The problem is that we brought the movies. That's the problem. In that film, one of, the, um, one of your friends was working on it, Henry Jaglum, and he uh, directed you in a weird and wonderful film, Tracks. Tracks. One yes. of the earliest Correct. Vietnam movies. Yes, yeah. Henry left early from Peru. He got in a fight with the doctor about the altitude or whatever, I'm not yeah. sure what, <laughs> and left. Uh, yes, tracks. That was that was an experience. Uh, actually, I was playing golf with Dean Stockwell yesterday, and uh, and uh, we were in that film together on the train. Yeah, Jaglum. Uh, boy, what a what a trip he is. Um, first of all, he had a script about this thick you know, for tracks, which I never saw or read, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, the whole thing was improvised from beginning to end. And sometimes uh, in the middle of the night, I was woken up with cameras there on the train, saying, get in your uniform, get in your uniform. What are you talking about? Just get in your uniform, we're shooting. Yeah. And this is the way, okay, so I just, the camera's in my face. And down the hall, down the hall. Oh my God, don't look around at the camera, down the hall, we're following you down the hall. Just open that door, that, that one right there, open it. And I open it and there's Barbara, you know, in a yes. negligee. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm throwing, okay, go ahead, she's yours, go ahead. <laughs> And she starts, I mean, in this, I mean, you know, it's unbelievable. I remember one time we stopped just briefly at some, we have no permission, we have no licenses, we have no, no permission to be on You're the train, just on the shooting train. on the train, yeah. we're just shooting, catching shots, yes. oh great, yeah. <laughs> yeah, running naked through the, yeah, it's really terrific. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, the, so my father worked in the railway mail at one point in his life, okay? And I know that everybody carries a gun, and I knew that you are not allowed into the postal uh, area of the train. Area of the train. I mean, it's a no-no. You yeah. get shot and killed for doing that. He insisted that I must jump into this, jump into this thing because that's where the coffin would be, you know. And and, and oh, it's crazy. Anyway, it was totally crazy. However, the movie, the movie on the other side of it, is uh, interesting. It's an interesting film. Yeah, it, again, it captures a time and place mm -hmm, yeah. and uh, an attitude and people's feelings about what were going on, mm -hmm. or it tries yeah. to explain it in not yeah. too preachy a way. Yeah. Um, I like the baseball things. I like all the guys doing the baseball. Numbers. Yeah, and, the, and, um, and Zach and everybody playing at the back and the, yeah, the camaraderie yeah, that's going yeah, on. It's a one, there's some yeah. wonderful stuff in there. Yeah. 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 Another film in a different country, you went and played an Australian hero yeah, and Mad Dog. Mad Dog Morgan, right. Yeah. yeah. That was Jeremy Thomas's uh, first, uh, first feature with actors. Uh, he's a dear man, Jeremy. <laughs> yes. And, and um, he had, was it Philip, uh, Philip Damari? Philip, uh, Philip uh, Mora. 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 Yeah, Philip, uh, Philippe Mora directed yeah. it. Now, why and, did they choose an American to play an Australian hero? Uh, well, I think it was probably because it was right after Easy Rider, and, right. and uh, you know the, it was hot. Yeah. You know, uh, for a moment, uh, I uh, yeah, it's funny because when I arrive in or I arrive, I arrive in Australia because I went to get there a couple of weeks early because I didn't want anybody to be kidding me about Australia. I'd get there and I'd have a little knowledge before yeah. I start even getting close to the movie company. Yeah. So I arrive and on the way in from the airport, I get. A call in the car. I don't know how anybody even knows him. And, that's, you know, and it's Jack Thompson. He wants to meet me. Yeah. So, 
they meet me and it tells me he's at the Sky Bar or something in the hotel I'm staying in and he wants to meet me. So yeah. when I arrive at the hotel, I get checked in, I go up to Sky Bar and Jack Thompson is there. And he says to me, he says, I'll tell you something. We just had one foreigner come over here and play one of our heroes, Ned Kelly. And uh, it didn't really work out for us. And now we have an American coming over here who's going to play another one of our heroes. Because the last thing Daniel Morgan said was, the last thing that Ned Kelly said was, long live Daniel Morgan. And now you're going to play Morgan? He said, I think you should just have a nice meal and get right back on the plane and go home. Yeah. So, and I said, no, I came to play Morgan. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to play him. And he said, well, you may, you may end up here forever if you don't play him well. Yeah. So anyway, we became really close friends after that. And a, and a lot of rum. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out well. I mean, you captured uh, the spirit. Yeah, you know? no, I played Morgan. I, I thought I was Morgan yeah. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I really did, man. Yeah. I was fast horses and uh, yeah. yeah. I took that 151 proof rum really easily. Yeah. <laughs> man. Yeah. And another, um, in the variety of acting roles you've had, uh, very rarely have I seen you get close to something I know you're passionate about, which is art, but you did in uh, Basquiat and the characters you were yeah, playing. Basquiat, yeah, Basquiat, yeah. Well, that's Julian. You know, Julian Schnabel, um, Julian Schnabel's a terrific artist. Uh, he's somebody, he's also a really good friend of mine, uh, but I have a lot of Julian's work as, as, a, as a tactile artist. Uh, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of tactile artists now want to direct movies because I think they suddenly realize that, that perhaps the greatest art, uh, art of the 20th century was film and maybe not uh, the other, not painting. Uh, but anyway, they want to, they want to like, be involved in them. And uh, David Sally's directed a film, Robert Longo's directed a film, so on. Julian, Julian's got it. I mean, Julian really is a director. It, it, uh, working for him was such a pleasure. Uh, it, was, it was like he was on his 40th movie. And uh, as a painter, he's very stubborn. He won't listen to anybody about it. But as a director, he's very shrewd. He listens, he makes his decisions, and he does it. Uh, uh, I've worked with a lot of first-time directors, and I always give them uh, one clue. I always tell them the story about... Uh, about John Ford, that John Ford told me about going to, uh, knowing that Maltese Falcon was being shot by, uh, by uh, his, uh, his friend's son, Walter Houston's son, John. You know? And he thought, well, you know, first day at Universal, he's on the lot. I'll go over and check him out, but I'll wait, I'll wait till noon. I'll wait till noon, go over. So, Mr. Ford goes over, and at noon he goes over to the set, and he, uh, uh, he sees uh, John Houston standing there like this. Hello, John. Hello, puppy. How many setups have you gotten so far today, John? None yet, puppy. Oh, I see. Well, you just stay here for a minute, John. And he said, now lay this dolly track down here, bring it down here, put a close-up in there, and blah, blah, blah. Came back. So now that's going to take him about 35 to 40 minutes. My advice to you, son, is I don't know what kind of film you're making. I don't care. But what you do is you give them something to do, and then you do your thinking, not the other way around. Don't think and have them watching you think. Give, whether you're right or wrong, give them something to do, then you do your thinking. Anyway. But, uh, but Julian, Julian was wonderful. Julian wrote, really got involved, wrote the screenplay. The only criticism that anyone can really say about it are people who uh, have a problem with Julian and say it's more about Julian than it is about Basquiat. Well, you know, he's Julian Schnabel and he's directing the movie. It should be more about Julian or it should be his point of view it should be from Julian Schnabel, not necessarily from Basquiat. But it is about Basquiat and it is the flavor of Basquiat and uh, I think he did a terrific job. And he's made another movie since this which is which is about Cuba, which is just brilliant. 
I mean, it's just really, really genius. I mean, I, it's just a great movie. It's probably the best movie made this year. Last film showing is Colors, which is one of your best films. I mean, that mm -hmm. that again captured a time and a place. Mm -hmm. Were you hot? You were. Did you go for the job? Were you hired for the job? Did you want it? Well, actually, <coughs> Sean uh, Sean Penn, uh, uh, David Geffen actually uh, called me and said, uh, uh, Sean Penn and Madonna would like to meet you. Uh, like to do something with you, uh, would you come out to the house yeah. and uh, so on. So uh, David had a place in Malibu or on, by the beach somewhere. Um, so I went down there and uh, there was Sean and uh, uh, Madonna. And Sean had a, a book of Charles Bukowski under his arm. And um, uh, he said, is there anything that, that uh, he said, I'd really like to work with you. I'd like to do something. And I said, well, I said, you like Bukowski, huh? And he said, yeah, I like, I like him a lot. And I said, uh, well, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a film that you should do uh, uh, called Barfly, and you should really play that part. And he said, well, we'll buy it. We'll get it, and we'll buy it, and you'll direct it, and I'll play the part. And I said, well, it's not really going to work like that because, um, my God, I can't think um, uh, Oman Arkham Golan had bought it. Had he bought the one? No, no, no. The director. Um, Barbe Schroeder. Bar Barbe Schroeder. Yeah. Barbe Schroeder had, had, had. Got the rights. Well, no, he, he, had, uh, he had Bukowski write the screenplay, I think, originally, actually, for him. So, uh, and I tried to get it from him before. I tried to buy it from him. We got in a huge argument, mm. you know, and I said, uh, we, we got in a huge fight mm. in public in a restaurant. And, I was saying, uh, you made that terrible movie, I can't even remember the name of it now. Uh, and I made Easy Rider, it was the one about the junkies on Ibiza. Oh, Valley Obscure by Clouds? No, 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 no it was uh, Barbie Schroeder's, one of Barbie Schroeder's early films yeah. about junkies and Nazis on <laughs> Ibiza. It was the worst, uh, terrible movie. And yeah. I said, you made that and I made the same year, I made Easy Rider and you yeah. shouldn't be directing this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Anyway, we did, I did one of those. But anyway, I said, it's not really not gonna work. So Sean said, yeah, I, you know, I think uh, we can work it out. We'll go down, we'll have dinner with Bukowski. I said, believe me, and Schroeder, because he wants me to, and so anyway, Sean gets involved and he goes off to make a movie. Schroeder does want Sean to play the part. So anyway, when he comes back from Hong Kong or wherever he went with- Oh, uh, Shanghai Surprise. Shanghai, yeah. Yeah, Shanghai Surprise, yeah. with Madonna. Comes back and we have this meeting, which I know is not gonna work out. And it doesn't work out, and Barbie Schroeder really starts saying, well, how dare you even come down here, you knew this wasn't going to work. And I said, come down here, show Sean that it's not going to work. You guys should make the movie, get me out of here. So anyway, on the way back, Sean is really embarrassed, and he's saying, you know, I got this, I got this thing uh, 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 over at uh, Orion, uh, Bob Solo, who did bad, bad Boys, he's got this thing called Colors. And it's about uh, a gang in Chicago and so on. Maybe if, if you'd read it, uh, maybe, see if you'd like, maybe you'd like to direct it. You know, I'd really like that. So I read it and I went in with Bob Solo to have a meeting with Mike Metaboy and the people at Orion. And it was awful. And I said, this, doesn't, this is not gonna make a good movie. This would, not, this would be not even a bad television. And I said, this is terrible. This is really bad. And it was about, it was about a guy named Cowboy, a white guy in Chicago who was a gang guy, and he was using, he was using the black gang kids to like distribute uh, uh, a cough syrup, a cough syrup that was gonna plague, the, plague Chicago and then go for the whole nation, mm -hmm. right? So, and, uh, and then there was a white cop, black cop, who uh, you know, are gonna get involved in, in trying to straighten this thing out. And I said, this is ridiculous. I said, this is ridiculous. And he said, well, what would you do? And I said, well, first of all, I'd take it out of Chicago and make it L.A. And they said, are there gang? And I said, and I use real street gang. And they said, are there gangs in L.A.? And I said, there are gangs in my fucking alley. Yeah. I don't know about you, but they're in my alley. And like, you know, and they said, well, really? Uh, okay. So, so and I said, make it about L.A. And then uh, uh, make it about real, real drugs and real gangs and real things and make it an older cop, younger cop. You know, I said, you know, so. Uh, and then you got Robert Duvall and Sean together. Then, 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 then at that, uh, Bob, Bob uh, Solis said, my God, he came in here and shot everybody. I mean, might as well have just killed us all. He killed the deal, he killed mm. everything. And Sean went away and got uh, Sheldon, was it? Um, the writer that wrote the screenplay, uh, Ron Shelton. I, 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 Ron Shelton. 
is it, or maybe I've got the, well, whatever yeah. name, it's yeah. uh, uh, that wrote it, uh, uh, to come in and wrote the screenplay. And uh, uh, we changed a few things when we were shooting, but most of it was uh, his script. And he really got involved, and then I got involved with him. And uh, uh, yeah, there was less of a play down, there was a detective, a black detective, uh, <clears throat> Not, not detective, a black a social worker who would go and talk to the gangs. He was a little more involved in the ending, but, yeah. uh, but that was really dishonest for him to come between the police and the gangs and give us no, a speech. No, it's more about what was, you know, what, what was, what what was it. real on the street, wasn't yeah, it? Right, yeah. yeah, so uh, it became a little different, but, but basically it was his thing. And I had some, uh, you know, I got some really wonderful actors. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Robert Duvall, uh, I mean, he's wonderful. I mean, Sean's wonderful, but Duvall is terrific. Yeah. You know, and the two of them together, I thought, were just really wonderful. It was, uh, it was an amazing thing to direct uh, two actors of such high quality. Never once did I ever have to say cut because they'd missed a line or something. And I never saw them ever rehearse together. They'd go to their trailers and they'd mm. come out and bing. Do it. Uh, yeah, it was really a joy. Yeah. Well, it turned out an excellent movie. Yeah. Really, really hit a nerve, didn't it? Yeah. Have you wanted to direct more since then? I know you did Chasers. And yeah, I wanted to direct a lot since then. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, uh, yeah, I had, uh, well, I did Backtrack uh, yeah. with uh, uh, Jody Foster, and uh, Best Run went bankrupt, and uh, then I did, uh, I did The Hot Spot. Yeah. With Orion, Orion went <laughs> bankrupt, and uh, let's see what else did I do? And then I did Chasers, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> Chasers was not uh, uh, Jim Carrey's for pet uh, detective. Pet detective, yeah, yeah it was yeah. the competition. Yeah, uh, bad weekend opening there. Yeah, with yeah. Uh, the company uh, Morgan Creek yeah. that I made Chasers with. Yeah. So anyway, I, that was the end of my getting, uh, uh, being able to really find financing to make, make films. But now the technology is getting simpler. Now you can do films cheaper with, say, digital cameras. The digital thing is a whole new world. And as soon as I get out of this year of art, because I'm right, right now I'm, uh, I'm concentrating on these big, this big moving art show that I have going around. It's going to Stedelijk and Amsterdam and then the Mac in Vienna and so on. And it'll go to Germany. and. France and then eventually come back to the United States. But anyway, that's right now it's taking a, about a year and a half of my time. I can't really do anything else. Yeah. But as soon as I get through this, I'm really going to make a, I'm going to make a digital film. I made an eight minute one for uh, internet, uh, which uh, it's just, it's really wonderful. It's, it's, original idea or somebody commissioned it for you to make? No, it was an original idea. Yeah. Uh, 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 I got some stock in a company in, in lieu of making a commercial. They said sure. make a little short film for us. So right. I did that. I'm really happy about it. It was about a homeless person on the beach here. But I, I got an actress to play that person. Yeah. I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, but it's so wonderful digital. Just move it from here to here. Yep. You don't have to take 30 people with you. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. So you're still busy and you're still optimistic and you've still got things you want to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I feel like I haven't done really anything. Yeah. That's my take on it. Yeah. I, uh, I've been at the short end of the stick and still am, but I've, you know, I've stuck it a few times. Yeah, yeah but you can take some control a bit. Yeah. Or if you take control of the technology, maybe. Yeah, Then you've exactly. got to distribute the thing. Yeah. Well, you know, for years I've talked about a time when, like, you know, I, I considered the film work that I've been involved in, the movies that I've been involved in, chapel building. You know, you build the big sets and uh, there's yeah. all the technicians. And, and this, this art will soon be lost in the same way that you can't make the Sistine Chapel anymore. Uh, there just aren't the people to lay the frescoes, lay the tiles. Yeah. And uh, Michelangelo painted less than one quarter of the ceiling himself. So the easel painters came in, and you know, and now is the time of film. The easel digital has allowed us to become easel painters. Uh, we can make films now. We can afford to make films. That, uh, and uh, so it'll give a lot more people opportunities to uh, be able to show their wares. Thank you very much. Yeah.